Hello and good afternoon and welcome to our webinar on um, insurable interest. Now I'm, um, I'm delighted uh, that we have uh, such a large audience, uh, which just goes to show that um, uh, COVID and the rule of six and Brexit negotiations are not the only topic to talk about. And uh, insurable interest uh, remains a topic that is um, of great interest and of relevance to the insurance industry, insurance lawyers, and also um, financial or derivative lawyers. Uh, so it's just um, a couple of housekeeping points before we uh, kick off. So you're, you should all be muted for now. Um, there will be a Q&A session at the end. Uh, for which I can um, unmute anyone who would like to um, ask questions or comments. But you can also use the chat function uh, to, to send uh, questions uh, as, as we go along. Um, and I should also give a warning that this uh, session is recorded. And um, I believe that uh, the recording uh, will be available at some point after the session. So, uh, with, with that said, um, so welcome again for anyone who has just joined us. Uh, today's webinar is about insurable interest, and in particular the question, is the doctrine of insurable interest still needed in the 21st century? Um, let me first introduce you to, uh, to our speakers. We've got uh, Dr. Terry O'Neill. Uh, Terry, if you give us a wave. Uh, he's a, a consultant and he's a partner at Clifford Chance. Um, he has over 40 years of experience in all areas of insurance and reinsurance law, uh, Lloyds and financial reinsurance. He is uh, the reinsurance law legend. Um, and he is also the original, uh, uh, the author of Neil and Polonieki, The Law of Reinsurance, numerous articles and other books. Um, then we've also got Professor James Davy, Professor of Insurance and Commercial Law at uh, Southampton Law School at the University of Southampton. James, if we have a visual of you, you can also wave. And he is um, one of the leading insurance law academics and UK, his particular focus is on law and economics and social legal studies. He's got a very long list of publications and most recently um, he has published uh, Miller's Marine War Risks. And uh, he's also the deputy president of the British Insurance Law Association. And uh, then there's me, I'm the program director of the Insurance Law LLM at the Center for Commercial Law Studies at Queen Mary University of London. Uh, I'm also the Deputy Director of Insurance Shipping Aviation Law Institute at the CCLS. And uh, before um, I reinvented myself as an academic, I was also an insurance law practitioner with over 10 years experience in contentious and non-contentious insurance and reinsurance law. And um, most recently, um, I've become um, an author and which is the uh, topic of or the subject of today's book launch, uh, Insurable Interest and the Law. So what we will do today, um, first of all, I'm just gonna give a very quick recap uh, to um, remind everyone what insurable interest is, uh, what the law requires, and also, um, for the reasons for which insurable interest um, has been criticized. And then I'll um, uh, move on, um, give you a short um, introduction uh, to my book, uh, focusing on how the doctrine of insurable interest um, can be justified in the 21st century, and also re-examining the consequences of lack of insurable interest. Um, then uh, James, Professor Davy, um, will um, give a response or his views. And then uh, Terry, Terry Neal uh, will give a practitioner's view on the 
doctrine of insurable interest, and then there should be some time left for discussion and uh, uh, question and answers. So, um, what is an insurable interest? Well, at its most basic, it um, means the relationship between the insured, so the policyholder, and the insured subject matter. So this is the thing or, um, or the uh, subject matter that you are insuring. And um, what this relationship um, needs to be uh, really depends on, on a type of insurance in question. In any kind of property-related insurance, the insurable interest um, has to be based on a relationship um, that um, uh, creates proprietary or contractual rights in the insured property. So you'd be the owner of the car you're insuring, or you'd be the tenant of um, a property you're insuring. But more controversially, um, the law has also started to recognize certain um, economic interests in property, um, which may also be capable of constituting an insurable interest. Uh, so economic interests that are um, just based on being exposed to liability or suffering financial loss um, if the insured property is being damaged or destroyed. Now, insurable interest in life and life-related insurance is a completely different ball game. Here we've got um, sort of case law-based categories. And um, the main categories are that you have an insurable interest in your own life, so you can take out life insurance on your own life. You've also got an automatic insurable interest in the life of your spouse, a civil partner. And you would have an insurable interest um, in the life um, of another person uh, where you have a what's so-called a pecuniary, so a monetary interest in their life. So if you are um, a creditor, you would have a pecuniary interest in the life of your debtor. And there may also be such an interest in the employer-employee relationship. However, significantly under English law, there is no automatic insurable interest simply based on family relationships. So as the law stands at the moment, there's no insurable interest or no automatic insurable interest um, in the life of um, your children or your parents or grandparents. And then uh, insurable interest in uh, liability insurance, that's relatively straightforward because that's, that's based on um, exposure to liability. So already we can see that um, the definition or the meaning of insurable interest depends on the type of insurance. And then it gets even more um, so fragmented um, when you look at what the uh, doctrine of insurable interest actually requires. Um, so here I've got a very um, um, detailed table and I won't go through all of it, but this is really just to demonstrate that the legal basis for insurable interest varies as between different types of insurance. So in marine insurance, the requirement derives from the Marine Insurance Act. Um, for um, non-marine goods and land and buildings, the legal basis is, a, um, uh, is, is rooted in common law. And then for life and life-related insurance, um, the legal basis is the Life Assurance Act 1774, which is still in force after over 200 years. And um, as for the timing, when does the insured need to demonstrate an insurable interest? Well, again, there's a bit of fragmentation. Uh, generally speaking, uh, in non-life insurance, uh, the insurable interest has to be present at the time of the loss. Um, but in marine insurance, 
um, it would also appear from the provisions of the Marine Insurance Act that even at the outset, at the time of entering into the contract, you would need at least an expectation of acquiring an insurable interest, as otherwise um, the marine insurance contract um, might be at risk of being regarded as a gaming or wagering contract. This is in contrast to um, life um, and life-related insurance, where um, case law, the case of Dalby in India, um, has established that the insurable interest um, has to be present at the time of entering into the contract. Could I just ask, there's a little bit of background noise um, that you, if you're not, un, not unmuted, to unmute yourself, please, thank you very much. And then um, what happens um, if you don't have an insurable interest? Um, well, again, um, there's of different consequences. And um, the main consequence is that uh, your contract is, your contract of insurance is um, going to be void if, the, um, if it's unsupported by insurable interest. If um, the insured had an insurable interest at the outset, but not at the time of the loss, um, the claim will be unenforceable. And um, uh, for, for life insurance, of course, the, the, uh, the contract is also void. But as I said, the timing is that the insurable interest has to be present at the outset. For marine insurance and life insurance, there is also a risk um, that in addition to the contract of insurance being void, the contract is also illegal, um, which um, may then in turn have repercussions on whether or not uh, the premium is returnable. And so what I really just wanted uh, to show with that table is that um, the uh, law relating to insurable interest is um, really quite complex. So we've got a mixture of statute and common different types of statutes, some of them quite old, and common law as legal basis, and there is a fragmentation of um, as between different types of insurance, what is actually required and when, and what the consequences um, of the lack of insurable interest are. So it's therefore not entirely surprising that insurable interest has been in the firing line and um, it has been scrutinized and criticized. Um, as long ago as um, uh, in 1949, in a very similar article, two um, American um, um, legal academics argued um, that really um, for insurable interest um, to work, you don't actually need a strict legal interest in property. Um, the rationales are being served um, by having a mere economic interest. And I will say more about the rationales in a minute. Then in 1984, um, Australia took the very bold step to abolish insurable interest. Um, so it's, it's no longer um, required, first in property insurance and later in life insurance. Um, in the late 80s, the Supreme Court of Canada um, reduced the insurable interest requirement in property insurance uh, to a mere economic interest. And also the English courts have been increasingly reluctant uh, to accept the uh, lack of insurable interest as a, as a technical defense. So when insurers bring it up as a defense to a claim, uh, the English courts tend to look very closely and carefully. And uh, the general approach of the English courts is um, to lean in favor of an insurable interest. So if they somehow can find <clears throat> some kind of interest, they will um, seek to interpret or construe the policy in a way um, to make it fit that interest in order to avoid a situation where insurers can use lack of insurable interest as a technical defense. Then the next flow to insurable interest was the, um, <laughs> the Gambling Act, 
um, which um, repealed um, a very specific provision of the uh, Gaming Act 1845, uh, which said that all wagering um, contracts are void. And so now um, gambling contracts are generally enforceable. And this led some people to argue, well, with um, wagering contracts no longer being void, why do we have this um, insurable interest rule, um, which, has, um, which has as a consequence that the contract is void and which is tied to the idea of insurance contracts without an insurable interest being regarded as wagering contracts. And then um, we had basically all of um, uh, the UK's leading um, insurance academics um, commenting on insurable interest in rather negative ways, um, that um, saying that insurable interest is just very sort of messy and it's this uh, sort of mad mix of, of statute and the law is very muddled. It's also anachronistic. It sort of dates back to statutes that were made in the 18th century for reasons that are no longer uh, valid. And it's also redundant because we've got the indemnity principle, which really um, provides us with all we need. And uh, the Law Commission, um, sort of ha having um, read about the sort of prevailing academic opinions, then when they started um, examining insurance contract law, initially proposed uh, that insurable interest or, or initially suggested that insurable interest in relation to indemnity insurance is no longer needed and should be abolished. Now they have changed um, their few sentence, but really it was the Law Commission's um, tentative proposal to do a waiver's insurable interest um, that brought out the insurance industry fighting and they actually um, made um, uh, submissions um, in consultation to, uh, from, the Law Society, uh, from the Law Commission and really made it very, very clear um, that um, insurable interest should be retained. And the main reasons uh, the insurance industry advanced was that insurable interest was a hallmark of insurance. It um, uh, sort of strengthens market discipline and um, guards against moral hazard, it protects against invalid claims. And also abolishing it would be really quite um, disruptive to market without having any benefits. And on the insured side, um, there didn't seem to be any strong appetite uh, for, for abolition. So, um, uh, in essence, um, uh, looking at these different uh, voices um, commenting on, on, on reforming and show the interest, um, so sort of the words sort of the following ideas could be crystallized. Um, you could abolish the doctrine, or you could just um, clarify um, the definitions and um, and uh, tidy up the statute book and maybe um, uh, codify the um, complex case law that has built up over several centuries. Or you could just do nothing and let the courts carry on with an incremental development of the law in the area. So um, this is where my idea for um, a book basically came from the situation of um, uh, sort of academic opinion against and show the interest by the industry very much wanting to retain it. And also sort of just the pure uh, sort of messiness of the law, um, which initially I thought I would call my book um, 50 Shades of Insurable Interest. Um, however, this was vetoed by my, by my publisher. And I ended up um, with a book called um, Insurable Interest and the Law. And really, it's a, um, um, in that book, I'm trying to, uh, seeking to reassess the role of insurable interest in the 21st century and its place um, in the um, 
uh, in the insurance contract law, but also in insurance practice. So um, if you ask how and uh, if and how it should be reformed, I thought what really what we need to look at uh, are the rationales for insurable interest and also sort of the tension between um, the doctrine of insurable interest as a definitional characteristic of what an insurance contract is, but also its role as um, a validity requirement. And also, um, if you want to retain it, um, to what extent and how insurers should take greater responsibility in um, ascertaining whether a prospective policyholder has an insurable interest and perhaps declining to sell an insurance products if they have a notion uh, that the policy, prospective policyholder doesn't. So um, taking a closer look at the rationales for insurable interest, um, traditionally insurable interest has been um, justified um, by reference to what's called the anti-raging rationale, any moral hazard rationale, and I'll say more about this in a minute. But I also um, identified um, another rationale, um, which is to do with how the doctrine of insurable interest is interconnected and as part of a larger system of insurance contract law. So, now the uh, anti-wagering um, rationale, um, what it really means is it's to say that the doctrine of insurable interest serves us as a dividing line between what a contract of insurance is and what gambling is. And this um, idea of using insurable interest to distinguish between insurance and wagering, that really comes out very clearly from the um, preamble of the first Marine Insurance Act from 1746, but also from the provisions of the current Marine Insurance Act and from the Life Assurance Act 1774. Um, now, is that um, rationale, um, does, does it still stand? Where some academics like Professor Laurie and Professor Rawlings have um, argued that um, now with the Gambling Act, gaming has become a legitimate activity. So we no longer need uh, to distinguish between insurance and wagering. And then if regulation is required, this should be done um, by specific regulation, uh, regulating um, um, gambling operators and uh, regulating financial services, but we don't need um, contract law to do that. And um, along similar lines, Professor Clark has said that preventing gambling under the guise of insurance is no longer a sound reason for insurable interest. Now that gambling has become widespread and has been legalized by the Gambling Act 2005. And um, so if we look um, at, at these um, criticisms, um, gambling has become um, a very mainstream uh, leisure activity and gambling is now uh, permitted. We can gamble privately and also uh, commercial gambling is permitted in licensed premises and with licensed operators. But um, really, if you think about it, there's no need um, uh, for um, consumers or for, for anyone to gamble under the guise of insurance. What is the benefit? Why, why should you want um, to, to gamble with an insurance policy if you can just walk into a betting shop if you want to um, take a bet on some adverse or some advent, uh, event happening or not happening, you would just go to a, um, a betting stop on your high street and there was very minimal transaction costs and with minimal documentation you could place your bet. And you, if you are lucky, um, you're, you could get paid relatively quickly. Now compare this to um, an insurance contract um, which has relatively high transaction costs, you have to fill in a lot of paperwork. And um, if you 
do have a claim, um, usually it's quite involved um, to sort of submit your claim form and submit evidence, and then eventually you get paid a claim. So um, saying that we no longer need to ensure the interest because we can now gamble, in my view, really um, um, sort of misses the point that there's actually no need or no benefit um, for a policyholder uh, to gamble under the guise of insurance. And moreover, whilst it's all very well to say for um, policyholders or consumers um, being at liberty to gamble, um, I don't think um, the same holds true for insurers. insurers um, uh, they, they shouldn't be engaging in gambling. And here, the existence of an insurable interest uh, distinguishes between an insurance contract and it distinguishes from other contracts of speculations. Um, we, we know that, um, that uh, it's sort of the criteria that distinguishes it from gambling contracts from the uh, Carlyle and Carbonic Smoke Book um, Company case. And you also know that it's the uh, insurable interest and the indemnity uh, provision that distinguish insurance contracts, uh, for example, from credit default swaps, which are also um, a, a type of contract of speculation. So um, this distinction um, between insurance contracts and other contracts of speculations um, really matters to insurers um, because it's relevant uh, to how insurance business is regulated. So it's um, important uh, for policyholder protection um, because there are certain um, 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 policyholder protection um, mechanisms in, uh, in ICOPS, um, the Financial Ombudsman Scheme, the Financial Service Compensation Scheme, but also on insolvency that apply to insurance, but would not apply uh, to other types um, of contracts of speculation. So for example, on the uh, insolvency of an insurer, um, policyholders um, and enjoy a certain um, uh, type of priority. Um, it's um, also important, uh, the distinction is also important because um, gambling um, by insurers um, can really undermine their financial stability. And here, of course, if you think back to the global financial crisis and um, we um, see the example of AIG um, who engaged in um, through its subsidiaries into various kinds of stock lending activities and um, uh, um, so where, where they acted as a protection seller in, um, in derivatives. Um, and it, it is um, sort of in these of various um, investigations and reports um, that were um, completed afterwards, it really became clear that it was that kind of activity um, so outside their sort of core insurance business that um, really um, contributed, materially contributed uh, to um, AIG's um, financial difficulties and um, illiquidity. Um, insurers um, also um, uh, shouldn't um, engage in business other than insurance business. So again, if they're doing something that is not insurance, they would be contravening that internal contagion restriction, uh, which is an EPI rule book. And then uh, once you venture outside insurance business, um, you would also have to consider how this um, impacts on um, the solvency tools um, that insurers have to comply with. And in particular, how engaging in some kind of um, gambling or even just in um, activities uh, such as other financial contracts of speculation, how this reflects on their valuation of assets and liabilities, on their solvency margins, and um, on, also on their investments. And then um, 
Also, the distinction between gambling insurance is also, of course, relevant uh, for accounting and tax purposes. And um, so in, in my book, um, when, I, um, when I examined um, what it means um, uh, to, to have an insurable interest or not to have a contract of insurance supported by an insurable interest, um, I looked at um, credit default swaps and I thought, but here we've got um, um, a contract um, of financial speculation um, that is um, very similar um, to insurance, but doesn't require an insurable interest. Um, but um, what, what this case, what this self examination really highlighted is that um, there are a number of negative implications that can be correlated uh, to the absence of an insurable interest and which insurance contracts, if they were not required to be supported by an insurable interest, would also become susceptible to. And um, here, so the, the main um, example would be what's called um, the empty creditor problem or manufactured credit events. Um, so to give you an example, uh, the, the Hoffmannian enterprise. Uh, so in um, uh, a few years ago, Hoffmannian enterprise, uh, US company, um, wasn't in financial difficulties, um, but decided um, to um, um, sort of take part in a financial restructuring and uh, they agreed uh, to a refinancing deal um, with a hedge fund, GSO, on um, very good terms for Hofnanian. But in exchange uh, for a promise that Hofnanian would deliberately default on an interest payment in a very minor way, just under $1 million, um, on certain um, notes held um, by one of its affiliates. Now, GSO, the um, uh, uh, restructuring counterparty, um, they also had um, um, uh, uh, credit default swaps, um, which um, under which they were the protection buyer, and that would be triggered um, if Hoffnanian um, defaults even in a very minor way and would lead to a payout to GSO of around $600 million. And so under these um, credit um, default swaps modes, uh, Hoffnanian was the reference entity and basically by um, arranging for Hoffnanian um, to default um, even in a very minor way, uh, GCSO could manufacture um, a credit um, event leading to a, a big payout. Um, so here we can see how not having um, um, a commensurate insurable interest um, led to um, uh, to so to two issues basically. One was um, that they took the financial gamble, but also that it is a moral hazard. And I say something about moral hazard in a minute. Um, but but also um, CDS also demonstrate um, that by um, not having an insurable interest, um, you can take risk ex exposures on the same risk over and over again, so you're creating multiple exposure, um, which in turn then can also sort of, um, endanger the financial stability of financial institutions and even create systemic risk. And these um, very specific problems uh, with CDS have actually been recognized and um, uh, countermeasures have been taken, like for example, the um, ISTA definitions have been amended to deal with the manufactured credit event issue. 
and uh, there are now also enhanced reporting obligations um, that also apply to um, credit default swaps as well as um, the short selling regulations. So my argument here is that, um, uh, yes, it is true that um, gambling is no longer considered a moral evil and that um, people are free to gamble. Um, but this doesn't mean um, that we should allow um, the use of insurance contracts uh, for, for gambling. And in particular, we shouldn't um, allow insurers to engage in financial gambling um, with, without any restrictions. So if anything, uh, the fact that um, gambling is now something that is um, licensed but acceptable uh, makes a stronger case for distinguishing between insurance and gambling. So then um, moving on to the second rationale, um, the moral hazard um, rationale, which is um, which has been sort of formulated as that we need an insurable interest because in the absence of an insurable interest, um, the uh, insured um, could be tempted to bring about the loss in order to gain financially, whereas the presence of an insurable interest minimizes the incentive to do so. So to give you an example, um, if um, you um, uh, insure, um, if you take out insurance on your own car, you don't want your own car to um, get damaged um, or, or stolen. Um, because you, you need it every day and it's your car, etc. However, if you were to insure um, somebody else's car, um, you, you might be tempted um, to um, somehow damage the car because um, damaging the car doesn't affect you personally, but yet you might be able to, to have an insurance claim. Now, um, I, I don't want to preempt what Professor Daly has to say, but um, in some of his research, um, he's actually looked at, um, at sort of hard numbers, sort of proper empirical uh, research, which shows um, that this um, rationale actually may not stand up to the numbers. Because when you look at the homicide statistics, um, you can see that uh, spouses, who, as I explained earlier, under the um, law relating to insurable interest in life insurance, do have an insurable interest they still murder for life insurance benefits. So actually, even having an insurable interest um, requirement there and having an actual insurable interest doesn't stop them. And um, Professor Clark uh, has said, well, again, why are we using contract law um, really to control moral hazard? That should be more something for, for criminal law to, um, to look at, especially as regards homicide. And then um, some American sh uh, scholars have even said um, that, uh, that insurable interest could even create what's called reverse moral hazard, because really because it's such an ambiguous area of law, many, some insurers may be tempted um, to sell insurance even where the insurable interest is ambiguous, because then when it comes to a claim, they can turn around and say, sorry, you didn't have insurable interest, I'm not going to pay your claim. Now, um, looking at the moral hazard rationale and whether it has a deterrent um, effect, um, well, usually, it's of the um, historic example that um, insurance insurers, and I've heard it many times from um, people working in the insurance um, industry, is of the spooky example of the flag riddles of Liverpool. And um, so basically here we had um, two um, widows in the slums of Liverpool in the late 19th century. And they took in um, lodgers, uh, would take out uh, funeral expense insurance um, on, on those lodgers' lives. 
and then posenomus as an egg. And um, so this is often cited as an example how um, if they, uh, if, if a proper and showable interest um, would have had to be demonstrated, um, these two widows um, could not have taken out the insurance and then the whole um, basis of their murderous schemes would have fallen away. Also, one of the widows did actually get married to, to one of the lodgers, and so she would have had an insurable interest. And then more recently, something I saw in the news a few months ago, which is also a very bizarre case. So we had a, um, a London um, couple who went to India and they bought a boy for ado adoption from a very destitute family in India and then took out life insurance for a very large amount with an Indian insurer and then arranged for the boy's murder. Now, again, you could have said um, under English law, if, an, if insurable interest had been tested, um, the, the, this couple would not have had an insurable interest in any in boy's life because you don't have an automatic interest in the life of your children. And, um, it, the an insurance contract um, would have been void, and if that had been properly discussed, then it would have abandoned um, their horrendous scheme um, in the first place. And then on a sort of mere probability theory basis, we created a number of policyholders without insurable interest that might ensure the creator a circle of people who might benefit from the distraction and then the greater the likelihood that one of them might be tempted to act or bring about the destruction of the insured subject matter. Um, but in addition to um, the temptation to destroy the insured subject matter, I thought um, that perhaps you could also look at it um, the other way around and you really should reevaluate the doctrine of insurable interest, um, not just as preventing um, potential moral hazard, but also as a mechanism, um, sort of a positive mechanism for aligning the interests of the insured and the insurer, so the preservation of the insured subject matter. So this is the idea of an insured who has an insurable interest having skin in the game. And um, there have been uh, scientific studies on what's called the endowment effect, um, which is to say that um, if you have ownership of property, you tend to take greater care of it because you feel more attached or involved um, with it. So by requiring an insurable interest um, that is based on proprietary or contractual rights, your contract as the insurer, you're contracting with somebody who um, wants the insured subject matter um, to, um, to be protected, and not to get lost and not to get damaged. And in addition to that, um, as the uh, so best case scenario, as the owner of insured property, um, you also have the access and control rights of making sure um, that um, the subject matter of the insurance can be properly um, uh, protected and looked after. So to the extent your insurance contract, so your standard um, home and contents insurance contract um, contains uh, terms that require you to, for example, to have certain locks on your door or to um, have an alarm, they're the kind of measures that can easily be complied with if you're the owner, but they're kind of meaningless or you can't comply with them if you're some unconnected third party because you won't be able to arrange locks on your neighbor's door and you won't be able to arrange a car alarm uh, for, your, for your colleague's Porsche. It's simply not possible. So uh, my... Um, uh, sees this here is, is that uh, insurance contracts um, operate more efficiently if the insured has skin in the game 
if they have an insurable interest. And this idea of skin in a game has also been so recently adopted uh, in relation to um, securitizations, um, where uh, both under ES, US and EU law, um, uh, the um, originator of securitizations is required uh, to retain at least 5% uh, of the credit risk, which is um, which is, was um, sort of supposed to address the idea of the um, shortcomings of the originate to distribute business model, where um, the sort of, um, um, sponsor or the originator of a securitization would simply generate business only to sort of securitize it onwards uh, without caring whether the underlying business was good or bad. And um, another um, moral hazard um, example, and this is where I've got, a, I don't know whether you can see it under, uh, under here, I've got a picture of a vodka bottle. And this is, I'm afraid, as much alcohol as will be served in this book launch, um, just a picture. When I first heard of um, Stoli, I of course immediately thought of um, Selichnaya Vodka, but actually it stands for Stranger Originated Life Insurance. And it is, um, uh, so, so it's the acronym for investment schemes um, that until quite recently were prevalent in the US, where um, a third party investor uh, would approach um, often an elderly person uh, to ask that person uh, to take out life insurance and the investor would pre-fund um, the premium and then immediately upon the life insurance um, being taken out it would then be assigned uh, to the investor. So the life insurance policy was taken out with the intention that the policy would be assigned to the investor shortly after the policy had been issued and it was instigated by the investor and premium was paid by the investor. Um, now these uh, Stoli schemes um, were very widely criticized uh, by most of all for their sheer creepiness. Um, the sort of investor, a complete stranger is out there wishing me for, for you to die very soon. Because the sooner you die, uh, the fewer premiums you'll have to pay to serve, um, to service uh, the life insurance policy and the sooner he'll get um, the payout. And then on a sort of more ethical level, um, these story schemes were also criticized for um, uh, sort of being against human dignity and for condoning attitudes that people's lives can just be treated as a speculation. And um, there were also lots of abuses and data preachers and, um, and sort of compromising the insured's um, ability uh, to take out life insurance in future. So there were lots of issues with it, but basically the whole idea of this, of this story scheme was uh, simply to circumvent the insurable interest requirement at the outset of a life insurance contract, um, which the investor would have needed in order and to take out the life insurance policy, and which could be um, sort of circumvented by the policy being taken out and then immediately um, being assigned. Um, so now um, most of, of the US states have passed legislation uh, to, to ban these stolen transactions. And um, where, where the investor has no insurable interest, and uh, to have a sort of a, a moratorium on, on assignment um, for either 12 months or two years. And really what these um, story schemes have highlighted is that uh, in, in the US, um, so at least the insurable interest idea is uh, still very much alive and people did have concerns about moral hazard and, and, and also had um, ethical concerns. There's a fun anecdotal story where the investors um, in one of these solely schemes uh, were a sort of Colombian track cartel. So imagine um, 
uh, an investor like that having a life insurance on, on your life. Um, and then, so finally, and uh, so we've looked at the anti-waging rationale and uh, we've also looked at the um, um, moral hazard rationale. Um, but there's also a third rationale which I identified and examined. Um, so if you look at insurance contract law holistically, you will see that insurable interest is not just an isolated uh, doctrine of law, but it's completely interconnected and integral to the whole system of insurance contract law. So you can't just abolish insurable interest without knock-on effects um, on, on other principles and, and doctrines of insurance contract law. So I um, looked at all the major principles of insurance contract law and uh, tested how they would work or not work if an insured had no insurable interest. And I found um, that the principle of indemnity, abandonment and subrogation are all completely dependent upon the existence of insurable interest. Um, that insurable interest was also important for the discharge of, pre, of the pre-contractual duty to give a fair presentation. Because as an owner of the insurance subject matter, we tend to have more um, knowledge of material circumstances. And um, I, I also found um, that there's a correlation between um, insurable interest and, and causation. And so, and then I did the same thing by looking at insurable interest and how it interacts um, with standard um, contract terms and uh, property policy wordings. And for that, I looked at um, over 50 property policy wordings on a term by term basis. And again, I found uh, that the doctrine of insurable interest is completely embedded in uh, contractual terms commonly found in standard property policy wordings. And yes, you could amend those um, policy wordings, but the fact that uh, insurable interest is so embedded in it really just goes to show how integral the doctrine of insurable interest is to insurance contracts. And um, I also um, um, interviewed um, some uh, representatives of the insurance market and um, again it was very clear that um, they considered insurable interest as an essential characteristic of contracts of insurance. So it was um, so, uh, sound by like insurable interest is the DNA of the market, hallmark of insurance and um, so in addition to uh, Paul Hazard and um, distinguishing insurance contracts and wagering. Insurable interest um, also is completely um, interconnected um, with insurance contract law as a whole. Okay, how are we on time? So, okay, so, time. so in, um, in summary, um, I, I did find uh, that there was a case uh, for retaining the doctrine of insurable interest because the traditional rationales, the anti wagering and the moral hazard rationale, um, they still remain relevant. And um, in fact, um, uh, they've acquired um, sort of a fresh importance um, after the financial crisis. And if you look at um, differentiating um, insurance contracts from other financial contracts of speculation, but also have become more relevant since the liberalization of gambling. Um, I also found uh, that the doctrine of insured interest remains important um, because it aligns the interest of the insured and insurers. That's the idea of having skin in the game. And I found um, that the doctrine of insurable interest is integral to the operation of other doctrines and principles of insurance law and uh, the performance of standard contract terms. And in addition, uh, of course, the insurance market perceives insurable interest to be part of their market practice and is an essential characteristic of contracts of insurance. So um, 
I found reasons why insurable interest remains relevant. And um, in my view, there is simply no positive case uh, for the abolition of the doctrine. So if that conclusion is um, accepted, so if insurable interest is retained, and I'm not saying it doesn't need reform, I'm just saying um, the doctrine should be retained, you then also have to consider um, remedies and enforcement. So the current position is that um, any contract of insurance that lacks an insurable interest um, is rendered void if, they, if there's no um, insurable interest at all, or if there was an insurable interest but it's subsequently lost in property insurance, the claim also becomes, un any claim thereunder becomes unenforceable. Um, there is a sort of bit of uncertainty around whether premium is returnable, and of course, uh, for certain types of um, insurance contracts, marine and life, um, there's also the risk of the contract, in addition to being um, void, it also being illegal. Also maybe we can say it's um, illegal in a very specific and limited way, I don't know. So anyway, um, these um, consequences uh, that follow from a lack of insurable interest have been criticized. Um, so the Law Commission, um, for example, has said that um, these consequences are really quite um, one-sided. So the insurer can bite the risk, collect the premium, and then if it comes to a claim, he just turns around and says, sorry, I'm not going to pay the claim um, because you, policyholder, you don't have an insurable interest. So there is a bit of a, an asymmetry um, that the um, um, risk or the, the um, consequences of lack of insurable interest very heavily weigh on the insured, um, whereas the insurer can just um, walk off and potentially even keep the premium. And this uh, sentiment of um, unfairness or asymmetry is also reflected in the court's approach uh, that they want to lean in favor of an insurable interest if somehow they can um, discover them um, and make it work with the terms of the contract. And then um, Professor Davy has, has uh, also said um, that it's um, sort of the sort of enforcement or the remedial regime um, is also really quite ineffective because um, it may never it may ne never be discovered that an insurance contract um, lacked an insurable interest. And in fact, it may be in the interest of both parties to um, carry on this out. And it really depends upon the insurer raising insurable interest as a defense. And um, I mean, there's, there is probably a very wide consensus that the uh, illegality consequence, in addition to the um, contract being void, is completely disproportionate and also unnecessary. And, um, but I'd like to turn your attention to something in a bit more detail, which I'm calling um, the remedial gap in the unsuitable policy scenario. So the unsuitable policy um, scenario arises because, or could arise, because at the pre-contract stage, we have the, um, um, this presentation or the um, filling in um, uh, a questionnaire in, in consumer insurance by, by the insured. Um, but the insurer is not required to, ch to check for an insurable interest. And of course, the policyholder may not even know um, that, um, that there is such a requirement. They may be completely ignorant um, that insurance contracts require um, an insurable interest. So you could, the policyholder could find itself in a situation um, where um, he suffers a genuine loss in relation to which he or she thought they had insurance protection, 
but then as it turns out, um, they don't um, because they lack an insurable interest under that kind of insurance, under that type of insurance. However, the policyholder might have had an insurable interest and accordingly might have had an enforceable claim if he had insured under a different kind of policy or if um, a different person, maybe a person under his control, for example, a company, could have insured the subject matter um, uh, um, but under, uh, under the name of, of a different person. So here I'm thinking about um, corporate assets um, in which, <laughs> so imagine a small company, um, privately owned company, corporate assets, um, the uh, owner director <laughs> insured the corporate um, asset um, himself or herself, doesn't have an insurable interest because the asset belongs to the company, but it would have been very easy for him as the director and the controller of the company to arrange insurance for that corporate asset um, in a, a, for an, under policy in the name of the company. So here we've got a genuine loss. He could have insured, but he simply had an unsuitable policy. And now you're in a position where you've um, paid premium, you don't have cover, and of course, it's too late to take out that alternative policy. Um, so you've not only have an uninsured loss, you, you also lost your chance to insure with a different kind of policy. Um, there are no contractual remedies for the policyholder in, in this situation. And um, there's no remedy under the in Insurance Act and um, under CITRA with the uh, pre-contractual disclosures um, that are required under the Insurance Act Part, part 2, they're, they're one-sided. So that's in dis disclosures that are being made um, by, by the insured. There's no, there's no reverse of the insurer saying, uh, 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 saying, well, I want you to have an insurable interest and this is what it looks like. Um, in, in that scenario, uh, you could, of course, say um, there are potential regulatory contraventions by the insurer. Um, for example, breaches of office permission or breaches of the principles of business or ICOPS, uh, potentially um, mis-selling. Uh, but short of, um, sort of hardcore mis-selling, these regulatory contraventions, they are, um, so first of all, Features of the uh, PIA rulebook, they're not actionable at all um, by, by policyholders. And features of the um, FCA handbook, um, there are limited um, rights of, of private action under Section 138D of the Financial Services Markets Act, but only for consumers, only for preachers of um, actual rules, so not guidance and also um, subject to certain other um, exceptions and exclusions. So there's no, um, no remedy of, of damages um, of the policyholder that's readily available. Now you could say, um, yeah, what about the financial ombudsman? Um, I looked at uh, the financial ombudsman cases uh, for a period of five years and um, of course, there were millions of cases to do with um, uh, 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 PI, uh, sort of indemnity um, insurance, but there were only about 35 uh, cases that had um, insurable interest issues. And out of those 35, um, the financial ombudsman, sort of rather uncharacteristically, actually. Um, they mostly took a very um, conservative um, black letter law approach to these cases, uh, deciding um, these insurable interest points um, uh, very conservatively. So the financial ombudsman is not necessarily an, an avenue of redress. Uh, so with this 
remedial gap in the unsuitable policy scenario in mind, I asked myself, how could you make this remedies enforcement regime fairer and more efficient? And um, so, to my mind, the answer is that um, just like the Law Commission aimed to rebalance uh, the party's duties in relation to uh, risk presentation, a similar kind of thought process uh, was required in, in relation to insurable interest. So really, um, if you're aiming to close that remedial gap, um, we have to think about how insurers um, might need to take greater responsibility of um, considering insurable interest at the pre-contract stage. Now, how could this be done? Um, well, I thought, well, first of all, um, there could be um, a duty on the insurer to decline to enter into a contract of insurance if they know at the time of the contract that it would turn out to be void for lack of insurable interest. So if that's clearing the obvious, they just have to say, no, we're not going to insure this. This is not a risk we, we want to take on. And then um, to also offer a remedy if in breach of their duty, an insurer um, goes on regardless. Now, um, this duty to decline, of course, um, would be pivoted on the insurer's knowledge. Now, how is the insurer to know what kind of relationship the insured or the, or the prospective policyholder has with the insured subject matter? Now, it, this may not be become obvious from, from the risk presentation or from the, from the questionnaire. So, and it would be too burdensome uh, to impose a duty on insurers to actively investigate it. So what I thought um, might work is if you um, just expand the IPIT um, just a little bit um, by um, including a requirement on the insurer or the insurance distributor to um, provide information on the insurable interest requirement to say on the IPIT, this is a such and such policy and you need to have an insurable interest in um, the property X or whatever it is. And this is what it means. Now, um, would this be to onerous on insurers? Well, it is an, it is an additional um, obligation. Um, but then I would say where well, the insurance industry argued very strongly for the retention of insurable interest, they said it was really important to them and it was a hallmark of insurance and protected them from invalid claims. So as a quid pro quo, I don't think it would be um, too harsh or onerous um, to expand their duties in that way. And I would also argue um, that declining to offer insurance when it is obvious that the insured is not going to have an insurable interest is also within the scope of the duty of good faith, which is of course mutual to the insured and the insurer. And it's within the spirit of existing um, FCA handbook rules. It would also promote compliance with the insurable interest requirement from the outset and preempt the kind of um, costly and uh, technical defenses at claim stage, uh, which we sometimes see in claims. So, um, coming back to the Law Commission's reform proposals, um, there we are now. We've got an insurable interest bill, which was published in the latest version in June 2018. Um, the Law Commission has dropped all its proposals to do with uh, insurable interest and indemnity insurance and have now um, um, put forward proposals only in, in relation to life-related insurance, uh, which focus on um, widening the definition, the categories of insurable interest uh, for life-related um, insurance. 
Um, so um, the Law Commission's reform proposals, um, they will tidy up the statute book a little bit. Um, they will widen the uh, uh, categories for, for life insurance. Um, but in, in relation to all other kinds of um, insurance, it's really, um, unfortunately, a bit of a missed um, opportunity to, um, uh, to, to think about how insurable interest, the doctrine of insurable interest, um, could be reformed and improved. So, um, maybe this is what everyone has been hanging on for. This is the, um, uh, the discount. So, if, um, uh, if you are interested in my book, um, and um, you um, can use that uh, discount voucher, and uh, I can circulate the details later on as well. And with that, I say thank you very much and over to Professor Davy. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, uh, Francesca, can I ask you to stop sharing your screen and I'll share mine? Okay, right. Uh, perhaps someone can give me a nod if you can see my slides. Hopefully you can. Great, thank you. Okay, I, I'm going to be fairly brief here, uh, but I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the issues that I've seen Francesca uh, develop in her book. Uh, the first thing to say, most importantly, is it's an excellent book. I think it, it fundamentally uh, seeks to modernise uh, the arguments on insurable interest law, and, and it deserves to be read uh, thoroughly by academics and lawyers uh, and policymakers alike. Um, but I'm going to pick up on a couple of issues that she mentioned. The first, I think, is this common worry we have about, about the remedies, about what happens if there's not an insurable interest. And, and this, I think, is not uh, necessarily entirely new. Uh, Francesca's done a better account of it, but, but the first thing that got me thinking about this was Rob Merkin's work uh, in the uh, Anglo-American Law Review published in 1980. I suspect at the start of his academic career, similarly, I think it was one of the first pieces that Rob published. Um, and, and noting that actually there were very few duties on the underwriter, that this essentially was a, a series of obligations put on to the uh, on the insured to make sure that they didn't buy insurance without an insurable interest, what I'd call a, a demand side regulation. It's the customer that gets told off for wanting something naughty. Uh, you don't control the supplier. And that seems to me very odd. Um, it's also, I think, something that has been, uh, and this is sometimes overlooked if you just look at the law on the page, this is something that has class, you know, reeking through it. It's all about who is seeking to insure, about the kind of nice risks in society and the risks that aren't to be encouraged. So uh, Tim Alban, writing in the Connecticut Insurance Law Journal, did a lovely historical review of English law and said, look, the, there were huge numbers of life insurance policies sold uh, throughout the 19th century, which were technically illegal. You were not allowed to buy funeral costs insurance because you didn't have a legal duty to bury and you and you if you were talking about your child or your parent or whatever else you couldn't insure them but the market sold these products all the time um, so we then had in 1909 this is the kind of notional legal change permission under the uh, 1909 assurance companies act for policies like this to be sold but as i read this so it says, you know, among the purposes for which the uh, companies may issue policies, there shall be included funeral expenses, whatever else. This I would read as a kind of corporate law. This isn't a contract law rule. This is defining the limits of the corporate entity. This is the kind of activities you can do. But so often in, in insurable interest, we see these rules kind of bleeding into the contract question. Was there a legitimate contract made is answered by whether the insurance company was behaving according to its corporate limits. So the case that Merkin raises, and I, I, it's not one I've read uh, 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 before, and I, I picked it up uh, uh, out of this uh, when I was reading Francesca's book, it's Goldstein, and it's, it's only an overture discussion. But uh, Mr. Justice McCarty says, well, the, you know, the insured comes to me and says, well, it's not my fault. No one told me that I couldn't buy this policy, that it wouldn't be a legitimate contract. And he says, well, that's not the insurer's job. You should have known you were buying funeral expenses and, and this was not a legitimate interest that you had. 
Now, the problem with that is that he was buying for a tombstone for his mother. And the reason why he doesn't have an insurable interest is because at this time, the technical definition of funeral expenses did not include the erection of a tombstone. So you could pay for uh, a number of the expenses involved in the funeral, but not the memorial. And how do we know that? Well, of course, anyone would know it. You find it out by reading through all the tax cases at the time. So the idea that the insured was responsible when buying funeral expenses insurance for understanding the limits of that, and that being based not on a rule of insurance law, but on a tax principle, seems to me to be absolutely arcane. The idea that the insurer could simply say, well, we're not paying on this. So why is the law in this state? Why are we putting this duty on it? Well, I think there are lots of things that are happening behind the scenes. So often insurable interest cases, like Macora and all sorts of other ones, really there's a story as to why the insurer doesn't want to pay. And it's not the lack of insurable interest. Here, the son had bought multiple policies on his mother's life for funeral expenses. It was up to kind of 50 pounds, which is a lot of money in 1912. And the judges then sort of persuaded, but this is the kind of thing that this Jewish immigrant family might do. So there's a lot of what I consider othering here. These aren't normal people like us who would spend a sensible amount of money on a life insurance. These are other kinds of people. And I think there is through a lot of this quite a lot of sense of what kind of risks we see as legitimate. And therefore, there's an insurable interest found and it's approved. And what kind of behaviours we see as not appropriate, not legitimate. And it's not in the law. It's not in the rule. It's what the judges, how, the, how far they're prepared to bend the rules. Rather like, I think, the finding of consideration in general contract law. What we have here is something of a judicial uh, uh, discretion, a permission to bend the rule, to find an answer. And I, I think it's uncomfortable. For me. So I think Section 36.1 that he bases it on is all about what these life insurance, uh, industrial insurance companies should and should not be doing, and not about the contract. I think these should be seen as obligations on the insurer. And so I think these, these questions about, you know, should there be duties on the insurer are, are, are absolutely redolent of the problems that we saw 110 odd years ago. So, and, and Francesca's book, I think, is the, is the best place to start if you want to think about what duties should insurers have. And she has some really interesting questions there about denial and about information. And I, and, and I hope in the, in the future to, to, to write a, a kind of fuller response to this. So I started to think in preparation to today about the kind of things we might have. So we might have a duty not to insure. So I think this is a similar to, maybe not identical to, to, to the duty to deny. We might have a duty to verify. So not necessarily to, to refuse to insure, but to check. And we might have, as we've heard, something like a duty to alert of the requirement. And, and this has been done elsewhere. So here I have uh, Section 22 of the Australian Insurance Contracts Act. We heard about it earlier, repealing uh, uh, insurable interest. One of the other things it did was to put on insurers a duty to warn of the duty of uh, pre-contractual disclosure. So maybe there are kinds of things we could use here. There are, there are ways in which we could look. Here it's in hard law rather than a code of practice, but this kind of thing has been done before. The other thing I'm really interested in, and I, and I, and I, I don't yet know what I want to do here, but I, but I know I want to think harder, is what kind of remedies would we have? If we're talking about reciprocity, what do we do if the insurer breaches its duty? So in the US, and this is discussed by uh, Francesca in her book, you have things that look like a duty of care. So if I provide life insurance when I shouldn't have done, and that leads to a murder, then I might well have actions, not just from the person who was the insured, but from all sorts of other people who, who suffered consequences. We might use ICOB rules, which have their own kind of way of enforcement, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. Or we might have some sort of contingency rule. I think this is worth thinking about, where insurers are only allowed to raise the defense of insurable interest if they did something. So if they verified or inquired or in some way gave warnings. So I think we could think about tying together the duties as prerequisites rather than necessarily seeing a standalone uh, responsibilities. I'm very much attracted to her suggestion that we use ICOBS. I, I think ICOBS is really quite effective as a scaling framework. It neatly handles things like the consumer versus business issue. Um, 
So we have, as she's described, breach of statutory duty rights where we have a private person. We then have for uh, micro entities and SMEs, the possibility of some kind of soft law enforcement before the Ombudsman um, as a representation of good practice. Um, and then I think beyond that, when we get to large businesses, essentially this would just be part of the wider context for interpreting the contract or the relationship. But essentially, if you've got a case like Feezy and you have large, well-advised ship owners against, you know, well-informed Lloyd syndicates, well done, the law applies. I'm, I'm, I'm less concerned about injustice in those circumstances. So I think her idea of, of locating it with an ICOS is, is, is genuinely interesting and one to be developed. I'm conscious of standing between you and the great uh, Dr. O'Neill. I'll, I'll pause at that stage and hand over. Thank Can you hear me? Okay, thanks. Um, well, I was anticipating that somebody would say that we didn't need insurable interest at all. Uh, but I think um, Francisca is strongly in favour of it with um, some adjustments and even Professor Davies seems to be um, in favour of it or not against it um, with rather more adjustments. Um, so it's still unclear what it is that people who don't like insurable interest would like in its place. I mean, if you scrap it all together, that's one thing. Um, or the other alternative is to try and water it down. And the Law Commission has been looking at that as soon as it discovered that um, it was going to meet a lot of resistance to scrapping it all together. And at one time, the idea was that a person in property insurance who had a policy would be able to recover if he could demonstrate that he would suffer economic loss. And then there's a possibility that that should be reduced to uh, being able to recover if you had a reasonable prospect of suffering economic loss. Um, I understand Francisca's point that um, one can look at whether somebody might have an economic interest in property, but I find it disconcerting, and I'm sure property insurers would find it disconcerting, to learn that they should be liable for economic loss when what they issued was a property loss and damage policy. Uh, it doesn't seem to me to add up. Um, practitioners as lawyers don't come across this issue very much because it, it seems to be uh, something which exercises the minds of, of academics, but not very often the courts or, or lawyers. But um, the insurance industry is very, very much concerned with it. And I think Francisca's hit upon some important points about the way the insurance industry views this. Uh, contrary to anybody's expectations, insurance industry is not risk takers. They don't like taking risk and they measure it very carefully and they accept it in very confined circumstances. That's how they manage to stay afloat. And the first thing they want to do is to learn a lot about the risk that they're being asked to undertake. And as Francisco has pointed out, if you're not related to the interest to the subject matter you can't tell them because you have no access to the information which will allow you to put them in the picture properly uh, it, when you've got the insurance policy the insurance company is concerned to ensure that that property which is a subject matter of the insurance is well protected and well looked after and will impose obligations on the policyholder which a person who has no interest in the property will be unable to fulfill. And the insurance company is also, and the last point, very concerned with ensuring that the policyholder has had much interest in the preservation of the subject matter of the insurance, as the insurance company does. But a person who has no interest in the property has exactly the opposite position. His interest is only in the property being lost or damaged because that is the only circumstance in which he benefits. So these three uh, factors are extremely important in, in the insurance industry. And all, all of the people which Francisco has spoken to and all of the people whom I have spoken to are very much of the view that it only works if there is an insurable interest. Nobody's talked about valued policies and we don't have a lot of time, so I won't in any great detail, but valued policies 
skewer this whole thing. You can't have an indemnity principle if you allow valued policies. If I have a motor vehicle, which I couldn't sell for 500 pounds, but I can insure it as a valued policy for 5,000 pounds, I bet there's a number of people there who might think I might be tempted to see that it's destroyed. Uh, so if you take away the insurable interest requirement and retain valued policies, there's a significant uh, mismatch between um, people's interests. Um, I never understood Professor Merkins, perhaps Professor Merkins changed his view now about uh, insurable interest, though I doubt it. I never understood this desire to say, oh, well, insuring without an insurable interest is fine because now we have gambling. Uh, there was a report early this week, uh, 1.5 million people are addicts. That's over 2.5% of the population. Over 7% of the population, are, which is over 3.5 million, affected by addiction to gambling. We should not be doing anything which encourages gambling. Um, and I think the absence of insurable interest would also uh, increase fraud, as Francisca has said, and the ABI reported also earlier this week that uh, they think there's 1.2 billion in fraud um, applications for insurance payouts already that uh, with, insurance, with motor vehicle insurance, uh, 300 false claims per day are made. And I can imagine that there is no requirement for insurable interest. Uh, there would be a significantly larger number of uh, false claims. So I think insurable interest is a very, very strong uh, guarantee that insurance is used for the reasons that it is required. And uh, as Francisco pointed out, if you lose it, it will be used for other things and it will be used for other things where people will be asking for or expecting the privileges which policyholders presently have in the English legal system. That is, uh, as she pointed out, priority in winding up, the uh, FCA looking after it, the insurance ombudsman being available, SIDRA giving them much stronger holds over their policies and much and putting the insurers in much weaker positions when it comes to uh, claims. Uh, there's no reason why the insurers shouldn't have an obligation to ask a specific question about insurable interest. I hesitate to say that it's right that they should also have an obligation to give legal advice on what insurable interest is, but I still think that it's, having it clear in the wording that they should that the policyholder or potential policyholder should consider this is fine. I'm very happy with that. So I think um, you've almost got to your time, Francisco, and I should stop. I want to stop, but thank you very much for your um, comments, um, James and, and Terry. Um, yeah, there are lots of um, interesting points um, to but to, to, to what extent um, ensure the interest um, can sort of counteract an insurance fraud and, and also um, to do with, with, with the remedies. Um, I've, had, um, I've had a few um, questions here on the chat board and one um, has stood out, I still have Terry here, one has stood out asking um, whether um, uh, insurable interest is, is a common issue in practice and whether you've, you've seen it a lot in, in cases. I know Terry has seen insurable interest in one particular case, the FISI case, um, but, but maybe Terry you could just say a little bit more about um, whether it comes up at all in practice or whether it's just such a um, completely accepted phenomenon that, that nobody ever queries it. It came up in Fiji for very specific reasons which I won't go into. Uh, I've not seen it in any other situation. I've met a lot of lawyers on the call. I'd be interested to know whether 
uh, any of them see it very frequently, but my strong suspicion is that they don't. I bet there are lawyers who've gone through an entire career, even in insurance, without ever coming across it. Any, any lawyers who wish to speak up? Alison's there. <laughs> well, um... Still muted, Alison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say, can you hear me now? Yes. Um, I would say that very rarely does it come up in practice. Um, and um, the only time I've seen a bit of a revival was when the Law Commission um, published a report and um, a Silken Chambers decided um, to advise insurers to take um, that point in a particular case. Um, but there was um, scepticism about the claim. Um, it was thought there might be fraud and it was kind of an extra um, bit of armour for the defending insurer. So I would say that um, in practice, um, it doesn't crop up much, but um, it is, as has been said, something that can be raised by insurers if they wish to. Unmute, Francisca, unmute. Thank you, Alison. I, I know that our colleagues, um, derivative lawyers, are very, very keen on um, insurance contracts uh, remaining to be associated with, with insurable interest for the very specific reason of that it's a distinguishing uh, features feature from uh, credit default swaps. I don't know, do we have any uh, derivatives lawyers on, on the call or anyone who wants to comment on that. Okay. Then um, I've also had a comment from uh, from uh, David Naylor from Marsh, if I may read it out. It says, insurable interest um, doesn't come up um, a lot. Um, yeah, it's usually more with financial institutions who don't like how vague the line is, you really don't want to fall into another regulatory regime. Yes. Okay. Um, then uh, I've got a couple more questions here on the chat, but before I turn to them, anyone else would like to ask a live question or comment? Please speak up. <laughs> okay. No, then uh, we've, we've also had. Um, a couple of questions on the chat um, asking for me more detail on um, the uh, uh, distinction between insurable interest and the indemnity principle. Now, um, it has been argued that because we have the indemnity principle, which already looks at um, the insured having to prove a loss, we don't really need insurable interest because we've already got the indemnity principle fulfilling um, that function. Now, my view on this is that it's um, that they may be related concepts, but they are different because it is only when you have an insurable interest um, that you have a basis for your loss to be measured because it's not any kind of loss that insurance contracts cover. It's um, uh, the, uh, the loss or the damage to your interest. So you need to ascertain first what your interest is in order to establish, um, to, to, to quantify the loss. So uh, to, to my mind, insurable interest is separate because it um, creates um, the relationship and the potential exposure to a loss that, that is insured, whereas the indemnity principle is to do with the quantification of that loss. Um, but I'm happy to, if, if anyone else wants to comment on, on that, because I know uh, some people have very strong views on, on, on this. Well, if I may just to say, yeah. I think I'm one of the people for whom 
I'm not persuaded, although Terry made some very strong points, that, that a, a robust indemnity principle wouldn't meet many of those issues. So if insurable interest is only there to fix the cases where indemnity principle doesn't work, I can see some call for that. But I, I think at the moment we have it the other way around. Thank you to uh, Professor Davy and thank you to uh, Dr. Terry Neal for participating. And thank you to everyone who made the time uh, to, to dial in. Thank you very much.